something that they've got something that they don't really have. And and the emotional side to it. It's an emotional mm-hmm. attachment. Right. That, that's exactly right. So so I want to be cognizant of the fact that you know the inventors are not just being crazy here. There is a reason for their suspicions. Um, the way that I operate is, is if somebody comes to me with a patent search and wants me to rely on it, will I do that? Yes, I ordinarily will, but they've got to pay me to be able to read and review the prior art, you know, because I am I know nothing about it. Right. Um, so, and then I, again, I typically will if, if it's a if it's an outfit that I know the searches and I know that they're quality. That's one thing. Well, you know, there's so many out there doing searches that you can't really know everybody. So again. I usually tell the inventor that, you know, I will rely on the search you provided, but I don't know whether to believe that that's complete. Hmm. You know I what mean, really I know who to... I use, and I know the searches that they do, and they've got their own proprietary system, and yeah. if anything can be found, it, it is. Right. Because sometimes I'll send them a search, and I'll know that there's a couple pieces of prior art that, are, that should be in that report, and every single time they're there. Um, so there's not necessarily anything wrong with going to your own searcher, getting your own search, trying to interpret it, uh, and then going to a different attorney who didn't do the search and asking for advice, or even going to a different attorney and saying, hey, I, I don't want you to do the patent, but I want a completely independent analysis. Can you do that for me? <laughs> right. But you're going to have to pay the time for somebody to go through that. Of course. You know, Gene, it's really about it. No matter who we have on our show here, or I'm sure who you speak to on or or write about on your uh, on IPWatchdog.com, it all comes down to doing your own research, asking the right questions, just having peace of mind. If you speak to somebody, that doesn't mean that that's it. There's nobody else to go to. You might have spoken a little bit more than you should have about your idea to them. You're not attached to them. It's your, you can make your own decisions and you could do your own research, ask questions, listen to our show, obviously, go to relevant websites, uh, resources like IP Watchdog, go to the USPTO.gov, United Inventors Association. These are all people that are watching out for you. And, you know, besides that, even the inventors groups, people network off each other. Who do you use for this? How did that work out? Anybody that says, I can take a product and, you know, I'm interested in your product. I represent inventors. Well, what products do you represent? Tell me where, where your yeah. product is right now. I'll go to the store and I'll buy it. Well, I have a couple things that are in the works. I pitched, uh, you know, sacks. Tell me where your products are that I can go buy. Well, I don't have any right now. Well, you're not my guy. So no matter what you do, right, Gene? I think research and, and resources are very important. Yeah, I totally agree. And the one thing to pick up on what you were just saying is if you are an inventor and you really have an invention, not just an idea, the likelihood is is that you're going to have more inventions. Creative people create, whether they're poets, musicians, painters, or inventors. It's who you are. It's the way your mind works. So... When you're looking for somebody to, to team with, you want to find somebody that you can work with. That you, that maybe you like, you have similar interests, you, have a, you communicate. I mean, sometimes we talk to people, and I'm sure you've had this experience. You don't know whether they're really getting you. They don't really know whether you're really getting them. You're talking past each other. Nothing wrong with each person. It's just there's an incompatibility there. Right. An inventor really needs to find an attorney that they're compatible with or an agent that they're compatible with. Maybe technology-wise certainly is helpful, but more importantly, maybe communication-wise, work style-wise, et cetera, because when you find that match, it will likely be a longer-term match than your typical attorney-client relationship. It makes sense. Gene... We, we've kind of gone through the process uh, past the patent search at this point. Do you feel like an inventor really needs to go to a patent agent or patent attorney to file for their provisional patent? 
or non-provisional patent. I know a lot of people that just skip over everything and just throw in. I said that's what they. I threw in a pa provisional patent uh, yesterday. <laughs> what what's yeah. your take on that? I think that's a mistake for sure. How yeah. come? Um, now, I again, I have slightly different view probably than most. And and full disclosure, I am an inventor. My own invention is a do-it-yourself patent system geared mostly towards provisionals. Okay. Um, now, what I always try to tell people is, is that if you can afford an attorney or agent, then you should. There's a, the, the analogy I always make. You, you've probably seen the commercial where the guy is sitting there with a the butter knife at the kitchen table and he's on the telephone with the surgeon and he's trying to walk him through doing his own appendectomy. <laughs> and he says, you know, insert the knife here. And the guy asks him, shouldn't you be doing this? And the answer is yes, <laughs> he should be. Now, again, but if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you're hiking in Death Valley in California and you're hours away from a hospital and you need to take your appendix out, well, that's a much wiser decision, you know, because it's either buy it or die. So I use that analogy. So saying that if you can get professional help, you should. If you cannot afford it, and the decision is either I'm going to forego the project or I've got to try and do it on my own, then, then that, again, is a business responsible decision that you've thought through. And, and I have no problems with that. You, know, you can maybe use my system. There's patent yourself. The book is pretty good. Uh, there's resources online. You, you, patent Office has got all kinds of information. My website and others have all kinds of information. And if you can put in the time, you can go a long way on your own. Okay. Well, but that's I do fair. think it's foolish that where inventors try and convince themselves that they can do every bit as good, if not better, than an attorney or agent. Gene, and, and what it really takes is going on USPTO.gov website, uh, and pulling up a patent or, you know, taking a look at somebody else's patent uh, that's physically in their in their hands and go through it. What yep. patent attorneys and agents do, I feel just like you gave that analogy. It's great with the uh, with the surgeon, but it's a specialty. I mean, this is yeah. this is uh, it's an art uh, to understand and to communicate that way to the intellectual property office, the patent and trademark office, to say different reasons why things are, well, it's the meets and bounds, right? What, yeah, and it's, yep. it's unfortunate, but a lot of time law is code. I mean, if you sat down and tried to write a more convoluted sentence, you almost couldn't <laughs> at times, you know, and that's the way that it's required that we do certain things. Um, so when I teach, I teach a patent bar review course for aspiring patent attorneys, and I tell them, drunk on a bet, you could not come up with a screw your system. <laughs> and that's where the mastery is. That's, where, that's why you go to the professional. Now, I, I've also just recently written an, an article kind of taking a little bit slightly different view of this, is that you as the inventor, by me saying that you got to go to a professional if you can afford it is not in any way, shape, or form intended to minimize you as the inventor because you as the inventor are the critical member of the team. You're the one that has the invention in your head and all the patent attorney or agent is really doing is figuring out ways to pull that information from you, translate it into the patent ease, and then give you the best chance to articulate the invention so you can get the best, strongest patent possible. So the more that you can do as the inventor to familiarize yourself with patent law, with the way patents are written, the better off you're going to be. I always tell my, my son, my, he's 16 now, I was like, if you can read, you can learn to do anything. <laughs> so you as inventors, do what you just said. Go pick some patents that are close. Read through them. Not just any patents. Look for patents. You know, like in my space, I work in computers. I tell people, look at Apple patents. I, if I was grading Apple patents, I don't think I've ever seen an Apple patent that I would give anything lower than an A-minus to. Hmm. 
you know, probably, and that was probably on a particularly cantankerous day for myself, you know, because they're well written. So find companies, big companies that use good lawyers, read their patents, get a sense for the type of information that needs to be there, and you'll be much better off, much better prepared to give your, your agent the information that they need. Well, that makes sense. And again, it also depends on what your plan is going forward. Is it something that you need to focus on your intellectual property, your patent, or is it something that you're just going to move forward with your business idea as long as you're not infringing on somebody else's patent rights to just kind of be first out to the market? So my question to you, Gene, is once I end up getting a patent, and I get it delivered to my house, and I put it up on the wall. Is that is that a, a ticket to riches? Well, it, it it can be, but it usually is not. I mean, the the, the patent people a lot of times will think that the patent guarantees them lottery like winnings, <laughs> and no, it, it does not. It, I mean, I have all kinds of stories. The one that I like telling the most is my uncle was an inventor. And by late in his life, he had gotten to be the inventor who hung patents on his wall because he had kind of given up hope of actually making money. But he was an inventor, very proud of doing that. And, uh, you know, and if that's you, that's great. You're, you're playing an important part. I mean, inventors are storied in our history. Um, he was told one time by somebody who had high, uh, buying authority, this is what we need. And he set out to invent that. And he did. And he set out to patent it. And he did. And by the time he had the, the working prototypes and the, was ready to show and to start to get the orders, he went back to that person and he says, you know, that's what we needed back then. But in the interim, there was a shift in the technology, you know, jumped a generation. So rather than the improvements that they had been looking for, they were looked now with looking at totally next generation stuff. Huh. So my uncle was told what was needed, told that if he could come up with it, he would get orders. And it still didn't work. <laughs> so there is a lot of stuff that has to go right for you to succeed. The yep. patent is an important part of many business models because you're, if you're going to invest money yourself or you're going to look for investors, they're going to want some kind of competitive advantage. Um, but, you know, it's not necessarily the only thing. And uh, I'm sure you know Stephen Key in InventRight. He's written one simple idea. He's got two different books now. And he uh, talks to inventors very pointedly about this. Sometimes you maybe just want to be first, depending upon what it is. And, and many people think that what he's saying is, is that don't go the patent route. But, you know, I know Stephen, I've read his books, I talked to him, and he is a big fan of the provisional patent. File the provisional patent application, go about your business, and then at some point in time during that first 12 months, decide, do I need to get the full patent, or am I maybe not likely to get as big or strong a patent as I would want, so I should really just focus on trademarking, first-to-market distribution channels. Sure. And sometimes you go one way, sometimes you go the other. Yep. Um, Gene, I, I, know, I know we get this question quite often. People ask me if I know a patent attorney that if they love my idea, that they'll work on it for free. Uh, do you get approach like that off, uh, also? I, I know there's some... Some questions. At least <laughs> once ahead. a week. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the answer is there's no but no attorney does that. And and I think I can tell you exact I mean exactly why. When, when I first started my legal career, I did general litigation. The uh, and my friends used to make fun of me. It was you know the uh, have you been injured? Would you like to be injured? We can help. <laughs> and um, those kinds of cases that you see the advertisement on TV all the time, that people offer contingency representation. They only get paid if you get paid. And the reason they do that is because if you're in an accident 
The question isn't whether you're going to get